Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? I have a little flag next to a life in stitches on Amazon. I have a number one best-selling flag on Amazon next to a life in stitches, the 10 year anniversary re-release with bonus content uh, that I put out myself and that I did the audiobook for and that people are really, really liking the audiobook for. And I am kind of giddy and overwhelmed with joy. And I want to use this feeling to share a little bit of the audiobook with you. If you don't mind, if you would like to stick around and listen, uh, here's a full chapter out of A Life in Stitches read by me in a tiny closet uh, in my old home in the United States before we moved to New Zealand. We moved, we had already moved most of our stuff out of the house. We had a few weeks left in the house with all the staged furniture. So I lined our old bedroom closet with uh, moving blankets and recorded this book. And it's something I'm really, really proud of. So the fact that people are reading it and liking it and listening to it and liking it and telling me about it is just so flippin' exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm over the moon. So please enjoy this little gift of a full chapter from the memoir called A Life in Stitches. I'm not going to worry about the fact that a mosquito just landed on my forehead while I was saying that because uh, it is summer here. Um, okay, enjoy and thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Chapter 13, Maidens and Flyers. I've had plenty of obsessions over the years, from macrame to rock climbing. New skills take over my brain at regular intervals, leaving me little room or desire to think of anything else. But the urge to spin wool blindsided me with its intensity and connected me to a past I'd never considered. For years, I had refused to spin, saying I wasn't interested. I didn't want to try to understand how those pretty wheels worked. They looked so intricate with their dark wood and carved gears. The sound of the treadle seduced me with its rhythmic thump. But I didn't have another free minute, and spinning was just another time suck. I was busy enough with a full-time job, writing, and knitting. Then I touched a wheel, unable to resist my friend's encouragement any longer. Like Sleeping Beauty, I fell into a trance, except my eyes stayed open and the fiber flew. Of course, it was nothing but carnage when I first sat down to try spinning at my friend Janine's wheel. The fiber kept spinning into great undraftable clumps, or drifting into fine whispers of twist floating apart in my hands. The more I tried to grab it, the more it slipped away from me. I barely resisted the urge to stomp my feet and throw a tantrum. A fiber craft. One that I couldn't learn. I was Steamed. Again and again, I snared the leader with the hook, drew it out, and tried my very best to hold the fiber as my friend Janine had said, like it was a baby bird, though I was pretty sure an actual fledgling would have needed some birdie CPR by that point. With Janine's encouragement, I kept turning the wheel. My feet moved. I drew my arm back. Then, suddenly, something fell into place. I looked at my left hand and saw an amazing sight. Loose fiber turning into yarn. Finally, I held the fiber loosely enough. I'm surprised I didn't hear the bing as the light bulb went on over my head, but Janine saw it happen and she pointed it out. That point just passed my fingertips by a few millimeters. That was where the magic was. It didn't happen at the wheel or where the yarn entered the orifice to wind around the bobbin. The wheel itself, a thing that looks like it should do all the work, doesn't. Your hand does the work, as it draws back and plays against the tension the wheel provides while it inserts twist into those loose fibers. In a way, it felt better than knitting. In knitting, I created a concrete something. In spinning, I was creating a pre-something. Yarn, not yet knitted, held an almost infinite number of possibilities. Oh, I was born to spin. I wasn't some wunderkind spinner. 
My yarns were lumpy and, well, homespun looking. But within an hour of learning, I was making decent yarn. And within a day, I was beyond hooked. I loved the speed with which the finished product came from my fingers and whirled around the bobbin. In a short amount of time, I could go from owning a pile of fluff to owning gorgeous, one-of-a-kind yarn. I needed my own wheel. I had to have one of my own. But the next fiber festival was all the way across the country, Maryland Sheep and Wool. I understood it was ridiculous to fly that far when I could just do some research and probably find a wheel I liked locally. But a festival would display all of the different makes and models. I'd get to try whichever one struck my fancy. I'd have choice. Travel so far to feed a new obsession? Who would do that? My breathing shallow, I closed my eyes and clicked the buy button for the airplane ticket. Once at the festival, I scooped up armful after armful of unspun fiber. Nothing was safe from me. Rambouillet, Coradale, Targi, Cormo. I wanted it all, and I wanted it in every color of the rainbow. How could I guess what my first hand-spun sweater should be made from if I hadn't tried spinning it? So I bought sweater quantities of everything just to be safe. And then I found the wheel of my heart, an Ashford Joy. I bought it on the spot. I was blowing through money like it was water, but I felt such a need to spin that it was almost a physical urge, like hunger or sleep. I didn't understand where the need came from. I just fed it. In order to fly home with my bounty, I put the fiber into a large plastic tub from Target and sealed it with duct tape. I thought it was a great idea. I'd just check the behemoth, and my loot would meet me on the baggage carousel at the other end. Then the airline representative said, baggage sticker in his hand, Can you open this for me, please? What? I asked in horror. I couldn't open it. There was no way. I'd used the whole roll of tape. I had had to sit on it to get it closed. I just need to do a visual check since I can't see what's in it. I didn't think before speaking. And the words tumbled from my mouth. I can't open it. It'll explode. Everything in the terminal stopped and went into slow motion. Heads turned, mouths agape. I heard a high-pitched whine in my ears. The representative took a slow and deliberate step backward. We have a problem, he said. I leaped forward, further terrifying the poor man, and launched into DEFCON 1 wild spinner speak. You can't open it. I didn't mean to say that. It's just fiber. You know, pre-yarn, I'm going to spin it all when I get home. I have this dream of making my own hand-spun sweater from scratch, like I saw some this weekend, and some is dyed already, but some is natural, and maybe I'll dye it. I haven't decided, but if we open it, it will never, ever, ever close again. And who's going to help me get all that fiber back in there? You? No, I don't think so. I put my head down on the counter and wailed. I don't have any more tape. I must have been the man's first banana pants spinner because I confused him so much that he just let me through. Hurriedly, he slapped the baggage label on the bin and gave me my boarding pass, shaking his head the whole time. I wasn't done with the Baltimore airport, though. I didn't check my new beloved ash for joy. Instead, I carried it on in its clever backpack. As it passed through the x-ray machine, the person running the scanner paled. He glanced up at me and then back at the screen. I, um, I need to send that back through again? Okay, I said. He let out a long, low whistle and then said, Hey, Steve, you gotta get a look at this. It took a little talking to get it through, but by now I was becoming adept at inane spinner speak. They let me pass, confusion still in their eyes. In the terminal, waiting to board our plane, I couldn't wait. I took my new beauty from its case and attached a leader. I unpacked a bit of the fiber, purple merino and silk, that I'd put in the front pocket of the bag just in case. I gave it a good oiling. People started to stare. I didn't care. I began to spin. I got a few comments from passersby, most of them along the lines of, Whoa. 
One woman snapped, I can't believe they let you in here with that. Shouldn't be allowed. I ignored the comment, but it made me nervous. And I noticed a turbaned security officer had picked me up on his radar. I watched him pace back and forth, frowning at me. He got closer and closer. Was he mentally reviewing his handbook? Where was the giant wooden spinning thing section? Could it be a weapon? Did he have a responsibility to do something about this? Finally, he approached. I didn't stop spinning, but my heart beat faster, and I lost control of the fiber. It drifted to bits, and I had to look down at the wheel, using the orifice hook to pull the yarn back out again. The woman who had snapped at me watched with anticipation. You're spinning, he said in an Indian accent. He still scowled. Yes? I said, if he took it from me, would I get it back? Or would they destroy it? I couldn't let that happen. If I picked it up by its handle and sprinted for the gate, would he give chase? He looked like he'd move slowly, and after all, I'd already threatened airport security with an explosion and gotten away with it. What was one more security infraction? I used to spin, he said, the scowl giving way to something softer. It's what my people did, at home. I used a charka. Do you know what that is? I nodded, so surprised I could barely speak. It's for cotton, right? He smiled and sighed, bending his knees to come into a low squat next to the wheel. We were eye to eye. Yes, cotton. It's lovely, peaceful. I wish I could do it now, but I don't have one. Why do you spin? I wasn't sure how to answer. Because I have to. I'm not sure why. It's what your people did? My eyes widened as I realized for the first time, yes, he was right. It was what my people did. My father grew up riding his uncle's horses on the ranch, herding sheep and cattle. My mother was raised in New Zealand, the daughter of a sheep farmer. One of my first clear memories is of being in a New Zealand shearing barn, sliding down the wool chute and landing in piles of freshly shorn fiber. I own a hand-spun wool blanket that was woven by my great-grandmother. I come from wool people, from spinners and knitters. They are my heritage, and I was claiming it. I realized that's why the hunger felt so natural, why the urge was so keen. The grin could have split my face in two. My new friend and I talked spinning until they called my flight. The offended woman who had snapped at me stopped staring and pouted into a book. I should have known that, for me, spinning was inevitable. It's what my people did. Ten years later. That wheel has seen some serious miles. It's now wobbly and clunky and desperately needs a tune-up. For a little while, I considered not taking it with us to New Zealand. I could get a new one there, right? But I couldn't quite bear to leave it behind. Along with the cedar chest, it's the only thing I'm bringing that's not packed in a box. Lala's bringing eight or nine of her guitars and banjos, and she's sold so many more than that. My wheel is my instrument, quite literally. When we go camping at music festivals... People stay up jamming until the wee hours. I always have my ukulele nearby, but usually I just spin while others play. I'm not good at playing an instrument and singing at the same time, but when I spin, my voice travels up into the trees, winding around other voices in harmony as my feet work the treadle. It's not only what my people did, now it's what I do. I can't wait to get my New Zealand Ashford Joy a tune-up in her own country. I'm bringing her home.